This is the Business, Innovation and Technology Podcast, and you're listening to the second half of a panel discussion on the social impact of NFTs with guests Marley Arabidi, Elisa Merkeline, Maddie Lieber, and Ren Feizu, moderated by Jess Lau. If you haven't listened to part one, go back to hear our guests discuss some of the unique opportunities emerging around NFTs. I'm Jordan Roger smith and I'd like to welcome you to our show. What do you think is still needed um, to make Web3 in the NFT space more accessible to new creators and participants? So I, I think I can probably start on this because, um, you know, being someone within the company, I've been thinking this, about this a lot, right? How, how to make it more accessible to users from engineering, product, and all those perspectives. So I felt like a few things, right? Number one, it's definitely going to be the ease of use. Um, it's, it's really important for all the companies to focus on that um, and to try to shield the users away from the empty concept, to be honest, because I felt like lots of engineers are got like pretty excited about this concept. They just keep telling everybody about decentralization. But in the end of the day, you know, it's people don't really care, but the, the word like that actually scares lots of people away. Um, so I felt like it's, you know, definitely counterproductive. So, uh, and that needs to go all the way, you know, deep into the product design, right? We, we got to take some of the terminology out of the, out of the equation, right? Users shouldn't need to understand the decentralization or trust that or blockchain, right? To use their service. Um, there needs to be this more kind of a conceptual box, right, around each of these engineering terminologies. Um, so that would, I think, overall make these um, services much more user friendly in general. Um, for payments, it's the same thing, right? Uh, I see uh, they even have all of these engineering concepts like a net, like main. Oh, you're on the main net, you're on test net. I'm like, like there's no way, right? It took me like you know 15 minutes to research that, or right? how could you expect like someone? Not even you know from uh, from developed the country right I understand that right it's just just not possible so I, I I do feel like and this is just add on on Maddie's point right I felt like women um, they just have more empathy in general uh, I have some side business I've been working with uh, you know customers directly as well you know wearing my customer service hat sometimes I just feel like my my female coworker they're just like way better at dealing with um, some of these requests um, it's, it's just like in the nature of it. So I think um, we, we need a lot of that thinking, right? When we design the, the products for, for the users. And the other thing um, is definitely the cost. Right now, the, the reason, lots of people are accusing, you know, the, the, the empty communities are just selling really expensive stuff to, to rich people. That's, that's actually some, sometimes I would say you just have to because the, the fee doesn't make it, you know, reasonable to sell like $5 uh, digital items at all, right? Because the fee is like $50 or something across the board. So I felt like the cost has been one of the biggest challenges. Um, and we need, we, we're we already seeing some, you know, really good solutions um, towards that direction to minimize the cost and batch it and make it faster and all that. Um, so I think that's definitely uh, on a good path. Um, and for the first thing, it's, it's the same, right? I am seeing lots of people inside, outside the company, just doing the right thing, really trying to lower the bar uh, to use all of the softwares. Um, so that's, you know, that makes me very optimistic about the, the trend. Um, one more thing, because I came from gaming uh, with the meta, um, I think lots of these blockchain games uh, need to be more fun than more expensive. Um, and it's, it's a little bit ironic because um, gaming was a space everybody was like, oh, this, this gotta be where an NFT explodes, right? And then, Actually, the community fall the hardest. They really fall back, right? They literally killed lots of the efforts in this space because they felt like, you know, you, you keep talking about blockchain and NFT, but the game is not better. It's not more interesting. It's just more expensive, right? Why should I support you in building all these blockchain games, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So I felt like if on top of ease of use and uh, lower cost, uh, we can probably also think about how to make it more fun, right? Because games have 3 billion users in this world, right? Um, and if you can really make it go, make it work for these people, right? provide a value, um, you know, provide like real value I'm talking about, right? Not just for uh, group identities and all that, right? And also maybe you think about the utilities. I feel like that will go a very long way to the creators, to participants, like the entire community. Yeah, I think utility is a big thing, helping people understand this NFT that I own. How does this help me? do something, get something, understand something, give back to something. So understanding how that ties into the rest of the world, that that kind of helps a little bit from a mental model perspective. But I, I love what Renfei said about ease of use and accessibility. I myself have onboarded many women in my life, friends, family members, and 
it's really hard doing an hour long screen share video explaining these are all of the terminology that we use. There's so many acronyms. There's different ways that you can get money even into your wallet to be able to start purchasing NFTs. There's a waiting period after you load money in. There's so many different questions that people ask. And without someone there who can hold your hand and help walk you through it, it can be a little bit scary. And so I think it's been great to see that there in the past three, four months, there's been a huge surge in communities that are specifically focused on empowering and celebrating women within the space. I think we need to go much further. Right now, it feels like there's a lot of women who have onboarded. There's way more women that need to onboard, but there's a lot of communities that we are celebrating women. We have these principles of DEI that we talk about daily, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done for the rest of the 95% of the NFT world. And so using these communities as a, a way to help people enter the space, but then encouraging them to take these principles to all of the other communities and all of the, even beyond the NFT space in general and Web3 as well, just because we don't want to create these, these silos where we have women and, and men as our allies in one space, but we aren't bringing that to the broader rest of the NFT world. So I think that's where we need, that's the space that we need to, to get to in order for there really to be change on a more ecosystem level. The beauty of the Web3 ecosystem is the amount of foundational knowledge that you need to know just to get involved is actually relatively low. But the problem with it is it's all tactical, experiential learning t topics, right? And so it requires a higher touch um, approach to learning and educating other people. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of scalable resources to help people learn in mass about these tactical onboarding you know, topics. And so there are Coursera courses and Udacity and other things that will kind of help with some of the concepts around blockchain. But the ideas of like, how do you create a wallet? What do you do with your seed phrase? Making sure that you have like baseline understandings of how to actually use the technology is really lacking. Um, and I think that's something that we will need to figure out because we can't just have everybody relying on their friends teaching them. Both from the friend's perspective, it's not scalable. You won't be able to get the adoption that you need. And from an equity and access perspective, like we can't assume that everyone has a friend that they can lean on who has the knowledge and or the time to sit down. So figuring out like a scalable solution to onboarding is going to be really critical for um, more equitable adoption. Um, one thing that like we at Women Rise said like at the end of last year was that one of our goals is to onboard 100,000 uh, women and girls into the space by the end of 2022. And there are a few ways how we're doing that. And I would love to like share um, a few of the ways. So one way, um, and, and, and to me, it's very, very important that when I say 100,000, I'm not just like talking about um, people who speak English, uh, but also like, you know, uh, people from around the world. Um, again, this why I keep saying this is because I'm an immigrant and then I just sometimes even think how am I supposed to say the word metaverse in like my language so there's no word for it you know um but you know like how can we or even like for the people that like where I only speak two languages but like how do I communicate with people how do like we onboard people who where we don't even have like a common language at all like you know it, it's like it's not shouldn't be limited to like um, a certain group. So how we're doing that is we're uh, working with, collaborating with um, global organizations that already have systems in place, um, and they have they have trained staffs where they are um, speaking in English with a group of people, and then they're speaking in their native language with you know the group that they're trying to train or support or. Um, contribute to and communities they're trying to contribute to. And so far we have worked with five uh, or four organizations for that. And then we're working on our fifth one. And these are global organizations working in anywhere from like um, South Asian countries to uh, working in the African continent to South America. Um, and I'm very proud of that. Another thing that I have, I absolutely love um, seeing in the Web3 space is that at least at least I've seen this uh, in a lot of female-led projects 
is that they have this entire department within their project dedicated to education. And I feel like no matter if you're releasing like, like five NFTs or whether or, or a project that has five NFTs or 5,000 NFTs or 10,000 NFTs, even if you have like a page for your community, because of course there's YouTube and there's other things, uh, articles out there, how people can learn. But there's something very, but people keep asking the same questions, right? There's a reason for that because they think like asking directly is more, they'll get better information um, instead of like automated information or like information that, that they're going to have to try too hard for. So if you're building a community, even if you write like one page, just step by step, this is how you do like um, how you mint an NFT, what, what's blockchain or what's MetaMask or how you connect your wallet how do you make a wallet? This is how you mint like our NFT. Not only will that help your business, like in terms of like bringing new um, people who want to be holders, but that's automatically like as a community, as founders or as pioneers in this space, we're collectively deciding that this is how we're going to be educating people who we're trying to onboard. Women Rise has 5,600 holders. We, we like launched two months ago having that number at such an early stage is like I'm very proud of that but that came from us literally even going to people to people just exp like sharing that piece of paper that this is how you do it and then they minted one nft or two nfts just like how they would buy one piece of art or two pieces of art they wouldn't buy necessarily 10 pieces like an experienced nft collector would so i think understanding that like how people look at art or purchasing art in real world and how can we remove that barrier but it does it start with education and the third thing we're really excited about and what we're doing is we're working directly with students in many universities around the world um and building chapters um so and they're 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 specifically designed to onboard women and girls but we have um, a lot of uh, male professors and a lot of um, male students being a part of that as well. And that's contributing directly to the knowledge of computer science, um, uh, the knowledge of blockchain, and the knowledge of Web3 and NFTs as well. Um, so those are the three things that we're working on. And like, I'm really, and I feel like that's something that is um, scalable because there are endless universities, there are endless organizations. Um, and, you know, there are endless projects that are coming out. So I feel like that could be a good start. But of course, every day we're, we're creative people, you know, like so together as a community, I feel like we can come up with um, many better solutions as well. I think one of um, when you look back at the early days of Web2, learning offerings were not a priority. And it's taken a very long time for large companies to come around to the fact that that's actually one of the best ways for you to drive your revenue and sustain a successful business is to bring more people in, not just rely on the people that are already there within your audience groups. And so even like Meta, Google, these large companies are now starting to invest more heavily in education-based um, lines of business. But when you look at NFT collections or some of the Web3 projects, education was automatically built in from the beginning. It's always been a priority um, for the groups that have uh, you know, started early. And Women Rise, it's a high quality aspect of their mission where they're really invested in it from a purpose perspective. But it's really important to have that built in. And the fact that organizations that are on a much smaller scale are thinking about that way before businesses that are you know, 100 times the size is interesting. And I think it speaks to the fact that a lot of the um, high profile projects or businesses in Web3 were really grassroots started. And so they have that higher, um, or let's say a greater pulse connection with the community so that they're focusing on education from the get go. I also want to say, you know, I, I definitely agree with uh, Malik on the language part because I'm an immigrant, right? Um, and I, I didn't start speaking English until my early 20s, like a few years back. And um, I, I felt like the if you don't fill the gap for the language, uh, there will be lots of scams and fraud. Um, it could be a like for for us, it's probably an easy search on Google, and then like three seconds, you get okay, this is probably a scam, right? It's not how it works. But in other different languages, 
we have uh, thousands of languages in this world, right? Um, and I felt like at least we should try to have some of these education materials available in in a few major ones, right? And I think that will go a long way, just just protecting the users in general, right? So they don't get hurt, get bite like the the first try, because bad actors are actually those who work harder sometimes, right? And um, if if we don't fill the gaps, definitely they will do, right? And they will just twist the, the content to whatever their benefits. So yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, the language part, uh, just it resonates with me a lot. Yeah, the opportunities are abundant. Um, I think in the previous question, we talked about how like all the jobs in Web 2 will exist in Web 3, but there's still so much work to be done um, to make it more accessible, especially around learning and education. And it looks like we're taking the right steps over there, you know, from a foundational perspective, um, bridging that language and communication gap to your point, Malia and Renfei. Um, and then uh, to M's point, like ease of use, especially like in the onboarding phase, um, making sure that we can tie those to like hands on real world experiences. And then to Maddie's point, like making that solution to onboarding scalable uh, so that we can bring more people in. We can't really continue to rely on a friend or expect to have a friend that will give you that type of white glove support um, in, into the space. So how can the metaverse help open these doors um, and set NFT creators and communities up to succeed? So I think one of the things that, that I'm most excited about that it's perfectly timed. If you look at where we've been at in history in the world of work and what does work look like, we've seen in the past two years that it's it's changed dramatically. There's many, many more companies now who are remote first. And with that, it means you don't need to live in San Francisco, in London, in Tokyo to get a, a job at a top company or to find something that you're passionate about. People can work from the comfort of their own home in their pajamas if they want, and it can be anyone from anywhere. And so I think the level of accessibility to get into this world is is, grow, is going up and up and up. But as, as others have said, Malia and Renfe, the importance of making sure that that accessibility is open for everyone from a cultural perspective, from a language barrier perspective, we definitely still have a lot of work to do on, on that front. But from the location and geographic basis, I'm so excited to see that even from a hiring standpoint, you can hire people from anywhere in the world and they don't need to be just people that you can meet in a coffee shop for an in-person interview or people that you've met at a networking event that you need to pay thousand dollars for a ticket to go to, right? There's so many more opportunities now for anyone to start building these connections to get into the industry and as a, as of someone who's passionate about what's going on to work really hard and demonstrate your skills and be able to build those connections. So I think that cultural phenomenon of how we interact with one another, how we build connections, how we learn about different cultures, because we're building these relationships and these friendships with people from all around the world. So I think our, our level of empathy as we can interact with people online will grow as we have these new experiences. And the way that we view friendships, I think that that definition will be redefined as we are able to meet in this new virtual environment that's facilitated by the metaverse. And we can work in that environment as well. So the the emphasis on localization will slowly shift more towards globalization, which I think is a great thing as we try to be more open and diverse with the way that we think about solving problems and building products and creating communities. So I'm excited for what the future is to come. And I think the timing of the adoption of NFTs and Web3, along with the acceleration of the remote work environment, is, is really interesting to see how that will play out over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree on that, um, especially with the, the communities, right? I feel... Uh, right now, with all of the utilities we have, the platforms uh, we're on, um, the community is already very strong, right? The, uh, how they organize, et cetera. But I felt like if we really enter into the metaverse uh, era, the online communities will just be stronger, right? Way stronger, actually. Um, and what's interesting is that that will be more complex user behaviors evolving from that, right? Um, just, just for example, right now, uh, everything you see from the physical world can be to a certain degree mapped into the metaverse. Um, I think recently there is this game, not recently, it has been roughly a year, a blockchain game called X-Infinity, 
Um, so, you know, in, in this game, supposedly you are actually owning everything you have, right? And there is real scarcity in resources and the capital in the game. Um, just think of it in five years, if we're looking at a, a metaverse with that kind of um, uh, either gaming engine or you can even say a, a probably universe engine, right? Powering that kind of mechanics, you have scar- uh, scarcity in resources or most of the uh, things you can use to, to do things. Um, there will be basically politicians, right? There will be salesmen. Uh, actually, there are already salesmen right now selling uh, virtual real estate. Um, so I think um, when you map the physical world into the metaverse, uh, you can almost project all the opportunities there as well, right? The, the size will vary, but in the end of the day, you will have roughly very similar categories there. Um, so I think that's definitely something I personally feel very excited about, and lots of my creator and artist friends um, are, you know, are passionate about that as well because. Um, it really just removes a lot of these uh, constraints on, on time and space. Um, and also, let's say, um, it doesn't matter where you come from, right? I think Mark Zuckerberg, um, a few years back, he also talked about it, sh- it shouldn't matter much if you're born in uh, you know, Palo Alto or maybe somewhere in Asia, right? You should have somehow an equal chance. So I think this metaverse breaking the boundaries of time and space, that would really just help uh, the global you know, population um, to solve lots of problems in general and create lots of new opportunities. So I want to quickly, like I got really excited when Rafe was talking about XA Infinity and it has been so like, it has been quite amazing for several communities around the world. And then I heard somebody from the US and they're like, you don't even earn that much. It's, the thing is that, yeah, you don't, it's to you, it's not because where you are, the cost of living is insane. But where they are, where the other communities are, that's a, that's, that's like a life changing amount that somebody can like support their family using that money. So I think the opportunities in the metaverse beyond even just like, you know, these exciting um, opportunities to make like a certain amount of money with games to running a business online to having let's say like your small business set up in the metaverse to having an NFT collection um, to start with I feel like all of these opportunities are like you know yeah we're talking about like we're talking like leaders and we're talking like pioneers how do we change the world but like even on a very individual level people not everybody needs to change the world using NFTs and metaverse all they need to do is like earn enough to sustain themselves and like, you know, sustain their, like maybe help their families as well. And I think that's what metaverse and the NFT space can do for a lot. Um, Just a few days ago, I had a student from Pakistan and her mother is the one who supports her education. She's in university and she uploaded like 10 art pieces to Polygon uh, blockchain sold them and she was able to earn three semesters worth of um, fee and her each nft it was 10 nfts and her each nft was 0.0.02 so not even like you know for us like if i see an nft of that price i'll be like oh my god i'm buying like 100 um because that's so cheap right but to her that paid for like three semesters worth of tuition um so i feel like that's kind of like the potential of metaverse and NFTs um, on like an individual level. And of course, like throughout these conversations, we have discussed like what it can look like in the most radical form. Um, for us at Women Rise, the most radical idea, at least what I have at, at the moment or what the team is working on, is building the first school in the metaverse. Um, financial issues are just one of the reasons why 258 million children are out of school. There are also issues like, especially with girls, like cultural issues, not being allowed to get an education. If a family has limited resources, they're going to they're going to prefer the boy to go to the school because instead of the instead of their daughter, because um, they're going to see him as like the breadwinner of the house. Um, so these are kind of like, you know, like building the first school in the metaverse, you don't have to rely on a physical building, you don't have to rely on physical books, you have access to teachers from around the world. Um, and you can, you can have an education, like flexible education around, you know, around your, um, around your own schedule. But then we have to deal with the, the digital divide, and also the language barriers, and like, you know, the cultural issues and stuff. So these are the things that 
um, through collaboration, through community support, and through the metaverse, we can like we can really use the innovation that's taking place in Web three in the NFT space in the metaverse space to make sure that we are like you know like starting with really young citizens, and then. And then also that's going to, of course, like have an impact on their families and overall economies as well. So, you know, you don't, maybe you need to think about it a bit selfishly as well that, oh, why should I help like this movement or why should I invest in this or why should I even like care about this? It's because tomorrow it's going to build a stronger economy for you as well. You know, it's like, it doesn't just need to be for like a girl or a woman or like marginalized communities. So I think that's the potential of, of metaverse and Web3 and NFTs. You know, when we talk about the metaverse, it's, it's there's a lot that goes into that, right? There's the AR, VR components, there's resourcing around funding, there's uh, like certain amount of knowledge base that's required. Your global reach is just much larger than some of the other scales that we're operating on. But there's great things too, like the flexibility that it introduces to other people, the potential that Malia was talking about. Um, but still, you know, this. I'm going to sound like I'm just talking about the exact same things I'd mentioned in other questions. The educational component is really critical. Um, And so when we're talking about like Meta as a company and Mark's version of the metaverse, one of the things that we really will need to invest in is educational infrastructure. And it's conveniently something that we're really well poised to do. You know, we've done this for small and medium businesses, bringing them into the digital ad space, onboarding like millions of small businesses. Um, And I think that as a company, we need to leverage our opportunity to bring in like best in class talent rigorous internal development processes, and then the actual technical components and global reach that we already have to figure out a way to help people get into Web3 and into the metaverse, right? And the only way that we're going to be able to set up creators and communities for success is if we have widened that net to not only existing creators and communities, but also potential future creators and communities. Cool. Um, So there's just so much life-changing wealth um, and experiences kind of already being created um, in the metaverse and in Web3. Um, And Malia, I love your point on that. Like, what does that look like in the most radical form um, when we talk about the school being built in the metaverse? Um, So my final question over here is, what are the different ways uh, the NFT space could evolve in the next two to five years? One of the things that I find super interesting right now about the whole space of NFTs, but also Web3 and the metaverse in general is every day I am meeting some of the most incredibly smart and forward thinking and creative people that I have ever met. And I've spent a lot of time in San Francisco meeting people working on wild startups. So I'm super excited for for what's to come in this world. I think we can't even begin to fathom what's to come in the next five years. We'll see incredible innovations in terms of what are all of the different applications of NFTs? How can they be used for things like membership passes, loyalty rewards, gaming, the creator economy, um, governance and contracts and everything to do with legal documentation? And the, the world, the opportunities are endless. And with the types of big brain energy that is working on this problem right now and building in this space, I think in in five years, it will seem like, oh, it's so obvious. It's so commonplace. These things are baked into the core daily practices that we live and breathe as we just wake up in the morning. But I think if we think about it from now, it would be absolutely mind boggling. So I think this, this is a space to watch. There's a lot of innovation happening. And I'm just blown away by the people who are in this space from a professional standpoint, from a personal interest standpoint, people working on side projects while they work at really cool companies, people that are coming into this space full time to develop, to build, to meet other like-minded individuals. And I think the, as we talked a lot about over the past hour or so, there's a lot of options for people with really, really different ways of thinking to get into this space and to be a part of that product development process. So as we all know, having more diverse minds in the room helps immensely, not just from a cultural perspective within companies, but also the way that you build products, having people from various backgrounds that have different ways of thinking about problems and different ways of creating solutions for those problems. The amount of innovation that we'll see, I think, is is just going to balloon and skyrocket. So 
it's kind of a non-answer to the question, but I'm, I'm just really excited for what's to come because the amount of innovation that's happening and the speed at which it's happening, it's like a, a breaking your neck, you're moving so fast speed, but so exciting and so exhilarating. Yeah. And also I think in the next, you know, two to five years, um, there will be lots of technological uh, breakthroughs, um, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Based on the trajectory we're on, I think, you know, we're, I'm pretty optimistic. I think AR will actually give uh, NFT community a, a major boost uh, down the road because um, right now NFT actually has a consumption issue. You, you cannot actually consume it, right? Um, or the, the value is somehow it's still kind of bundled or tied to the group identity you're buying into, um, you know, the social values of that. But once AR kicks in, uh, that's really a bridge between the, the virtual world and the physical world, right? So you can pretty easily just kind of you know display or actually use your your uh, digital asset in, in the real world, right? And maybe in, even a little bit more interactive with other people, you can share the asset, etc. Right? We all need a bridge. So I feel like AR uh, just being a, a utility, a tool to empower the value of uh, of uh, an NFT that would be very exciting. Um, and again, I think I keep talking about this, about this right? Web three compared to Web two. Lots of stuff are baked in. Um, and I like how it just forces the big companies to, to rethink their monetization model. Um, for the Web2 world, basically, you have this recipe, right? Um, it's like you, you put a bunch of traffic into it. You, you get enough users. You build this central platform. You're powerful. You go IPO. You do ads, right? That's, that's pretty much the, the recipe. Um, but I think for the Web3 world, it forces people to think, okay, how do we just do revenue share in the first place, right? Let, let's forget about the traffic for a bit. We have this token economy. Everybody has ownership. They can they can influence decisions, uh, and they will get a cut on whatever engagement they have, the, the contributions they have. Um, that just sounds like, to me, a, a better model, intuitively, right? Of course, there will be lots of details that have to be figured out. But overall, I felt like the exponential growth we're seeing last year, I think it was a 250 um, X growth last year for NFT from 94 to 24 point 94 million to 24.9 billion. So, and you know, Jeff Bezos talked about how 26,000 percent, uh, you know, seem cool. But actually, 2600 percent for him in 1994, he felt like, oh, that was crazy for internet. Now we're like a 10x of that growth, right? So I'm just saying that it's it's not. I know lots of people are pretty uh, you know pessimistic about NFT or they, they criticize it a lot, understandably. Um, but still, I feel like there's real value into it. If you just talk to the creators, right, talk to the people who have been enabled and empowered, you would know the difference, right? We cannot just read some news and say, oh, that's just you know not there. Uh, it's definitely there, right? I think there's a value there, um, and um, I like how it just bottom up pushes all of the, the big companies to rethink their models. And hopefully down the road, you know, we're, we're seeing a healthier IT industry uh, and a healthier ecosystem. I absolutely agree with what Renke has just, um, just said, all of, all of the points, honestly. Um, I think at the moment, a lot of people are entering this space um, for various reasons. Um, artists are probably entering because of the creative, creative side of things in the NFT space. There are also a lot of people who are seeing uh, wealth and financial opportunities. Um, and then there's like a group of people who are just like coming into the space due to FOMO. Uh, all of all reasons are absolutely valid, <laughs> I feel like, because uh, even if you're entering the space due to FOMO, you're, you're still kind of like pushing yourself to learn, right? Um, I do think in the two to five years, uh, NFT space is just going to be, you probably won't even be using the word NFTs, just, just like how we don't use the term World Wide Web. <laughs> so, um, so I feel like NFTs will just be such a huge part of our lives. Or even like you know, with social media, like we used to be like, oh yeah, social media is so great, like it connects people. But nobody talks about that aspect of it. It's so normal for us. So I feel like NFTs will very, very quickly become like a very normal thing where tickets will be NFTs. Where, like, um, maybe if you're buying a physical thing, like at I don't know, like at a brand, at a brand store or something or anywhere, you will get like a digital asset for it that you can kind of, I don't know, like use later on um, or flip on uh, some marketplace uh, for some ETH or I don't know, some uh, crypto or something. That That's a possibility. But one thing that I would really like, like to the people who are listening in or um, to the people like who are thinking about this space is that 
this hype of like, you know, like being able to make an NFT project, you will sell it. I think that's still not very true. Like there are, there's a lot of hard work that goes into the, the space. And of course, some people may like, you know, ride the way sometimes, but it's not going to last for that long. I just don't think, I don't think it's sustainable um, that it will last that long. So might as well like take advantage of it right now as a creative, as a creator. And I think then like the projects that exist right now, of course, like I do feel like they will have first um first opportunity or initial opportunities to explore how this space is expanding and like I mentioned like there's so many ways how it can expand like we're already seeing like some really fun things but then once people get off that that you know high of like okay so much money in this space so many nfts look at my collection all of, all of that fun thing right like I think after that high I think people will start to kind of see the true potential of it and in all honesty, even I don't know what it looks like, regardless of the fact that I have been in this space for several months. I'm still learning. I know a lot of people are learning. There's no such thing as NFT experts. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I, I, all I want to say is like this space is moving really fast. Uh, we will see. We will. We will see. Like we, there's a lot to a lot a lot to look forward to. I feel like it's it's quite exciting. Along with the vein of what everybody else has been saying, right, we have no idea what it's going to look like in the next two to five years. But the community around is some of the most forward link, like looking individuals I think I've ever met in my entire life. And everyone has a different idea. It's just an incredibly innovative group of people. Um, but like Renfe was saying, this is all about bridging IRL value to digital assets. And that makes sense, right? That art and photography and gaming identities were some of the first areas that um, had strong parallels. But in the next iteration, we're going to need to look into how we manage kind of atomic transactions that are really inefficient today. And I think that we'll start seeing NFTs not only for the art perspective, but for the opportunity in efficient exchange, right? And so things like Marriage licenses, they do not need to be stored in a courthouse or home ownership, land deeds, your car loans, your medical records, a patent, your academic transcript, your promotion history could transfer from one company to another if it were an NFT. Even things like voting have the opportunity to be you know, input into an NFT use case. So while those things are less fun to talk about and they're a little bit more nebulous to think through, um, I think it's really empowering that we're at this very early stage right now um, and that we have this opportunity to take out some of the really inefficient middlemen um, that we rely on very heavily in today's society. Indeed, indeed. Opportunities are endless. The growth's explosive. Um, the amount of innovation and the speed that it's happening at is just incredible and exhilarating. Um, this is a space to watch and get involved in. Talent's real and it's not too late to get involved. Thank you all so much for joining me today um, in this podcast and I hope you all have a great day. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this panel discussion on the social impact of NFTs. And I'd like to thank our guests, Malia Abidi, Elisa McAline, Maddie Lieber, and Ren Zhu for joining us and sharing valuable insight into this new and innovative space. And an extra special thanks to our moderator, Jess Liao. You can listen to another panel discussion moderated by Jess in our episode on innovation and on entrepreneurship. There'll be links to that episode and any other resources mentioned in today's show notes. Thank you for listening to the Business Innovation and Technology Podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star review.